So, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Prendergast, and I'm the president of the Galway Strategy Group. Uh, I'd, like to thank, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this panel, which is titled, The New Geopolitics of the Internet, How Will the Biden State Department Navigate Them? Now, um, that's what it says on the website, and that's what you were led to believe that we were going to talk about. But as we were doing for the, the planning for this session a couple of days ago, uh, we decided it probably wouldn't be best if we had um, – you know, four different people talk about the same topic. So we're going to take a slightly different take. Um, we are going to touch on the title, but thankfully not repeat ourselves or hopefully not repeat ourselves. Um, so we're not only going to explore the geopolitics around these issues, but also the players, the issues and the technologies. And what we also hope to do, you know, seeing there's still a couple hundred people who are with us, um, we do want to leave a good chunk of time for some questions and answers and hopefully make this as interactive as we possibly can, considering uh, the limitations of the Q&A pod uh, for Zoom. Um, and if, uh, you know, none of us like a, uh, a session where you have three or four panels who just talk on and on and on and at you. So um, so don't wait until the end to get your questions into the Q&A pod. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have to listen to war stories from Danny, Bruce, and Rob for the remainder of the session. So um, speaking of speakers, let me introduce you to our panelists. If you look at their uh, short files in the, in the agenda, you'll see that three of the four are all referred to in their former capacities. Uh, what I hope to do is catch you up on what they're actually doing today. Uh, Josephine Wolf, the only panelist who is not virtually based in Washington, D.C., is an assistant professor of cybersecurity policy at the Fletcher School of Tufts University. Prior to her teaching at Tufts, she was an assistant professor at public policy at Rochester Institute of Technology and a fellow at the New America Cybersecurity Initiative and Harvard's Berkman Kleinman Center for Internet and Society. She has a PhD and a master's from MIT and an undergraduate degree in mathematics from Princeton. So she and Bruce can trade some more stories from Princeton. Never went to the uh, math Danny Sep not once. <laughs> uh, Danny Sepulveda was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and U.S. Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy during the Obama administration. Prior to that, he held several positions in and around D.C., including senior advisor to Senator John Kerry, served as an assistant trade representative, and worked for then Senator Obama and Senator Boxer. Today, he is the senior vice president for policy and advocacy for MediaMath, a global advertising and marketing technology company. Rob Strayer was the deputy assistant secretary for cyber and international communications and information policy during the Trump administration. Prior to that, he was general counsel for the U.S. Sun Foreign, Senate Foreign Relations Committee and even spent time at the Bipartisan Policy Center working on cybersecurity issues. He also served as a deputy staff director on the U.S. Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee. And today, a few months into his new gig, he's the executive vice president of policy at the Information Technology Industry Council, better known as ITI. And then finally, we have Bruce Melman. Uh, former Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Technology Policy, the U.S. Department of Commerce during the George W. Bush administration. Before Commerce, he worked as the lead tech and telecom lobbyist for Cisco Systems. And he was policy director and general counsel to House Republican Conference uh, Chairman J.C. Watts, and he was general counsel to the National Republican Congressional Committee. Today, he's the founder of Melman, Castagnetti, Rosen, and Thomas, and uh, the author of the infamous or famous quarterly infographic analyses that are so popular amongst, uh, uh, you know, beyond Washington, D.C., actually across the country. So, Bruce, um, why don't you kick us off and sort of give us an overview of some of the issues you think the new administration is going to have to deal with in the weeks and months ahead? Well, I'm happy to, Jim, and thanks for the introduction. And uh, Josephine, I'm both a lot older than you and would never have gotten near the departments where you were majoring. So, uh, we haven't met previously. Um, given that it's a very international flavor to the panel, to my colleagues on the panel, and to what we set out to do, I'm going to offer my overlay. But what's important to understand is the tech policy issues that we're going to talk about are challenges both within each country or region and between the countries and regions. Um, and so uh, it's a uh, it is truly a 3D chess. Uh, situation where some tech companies uh, and products are loved in some places and they're, and they're of concerns in others. When I try to mentally group the, uh, the, the huge panoply of issues, I, I end up dividing them into three categories. 
uh, where technology is seen mostly as the answer, where it's seen as the problem, and where it hangs in the balance. And so just in 2021, where it's clearly part of the solution, first and foremost, healthcare. You know, telehealth has been an extraordinary home run, but you're also going to see in things like wearables and the use of AI and therapeutics and immunotherapy, tech is a huge part of the answer. And education, you know, it's it, being in school, there's no substitute for being in school, but as between nothing and being in school, what they've been able to do on Zoom is certainly better than nothing. Uh, on climate, uh, there's been, it's been under discussed. I think the future is going to be much more hybrid and we're going to see a lot of decarbonization by people who realize that you can have conferences that include more people, that reach more geographies and that uh, generate a lot less carbon. Uh, when the economy, clearly tech has been part of what's kept it afloat and tech will be critical to keep all economies around the world growing. And then even on some of the social justice issues where technology um, can enable, enable and empower activists. That's one of the reasons you just saw a letter to go cautious on, uh, on Section 230 by so many civil rights groups to the administration. Where tech is considered the problem, you know, uh, that's where both within countries and between countries you've got issues. So competition policy. You know, data is the new oil and there's a new uh, Rockefeller and a new Carnegie and, and, you know, and the new robber barons of our Gilded Age um, are almost all within tech and are generally a, a small number of data dominant players. And there's a lot of look at the state level, at the federal level, at the global level at that. A lot of questions on consumer privacy and, and, and how do we protect whether it's uh, consumer protection, whether it's uh, consumer privacy or content moderation or digital addiction. Questions on inequality. Broadband's awesome unless you don't have it. And if it's not available or you can't afford it, it's uh, further distancing you from the people you've already been trying to catch up with. Uh, there will be a lot of discussion as there needs to be about digital inclusion, questions such as algorithmic bias uh, or just the uh, diversity within the workforce of tech companies. And then finally, um, as we've been seeing, mistrust. You know, it's, it's uh, on the one hand, uh, the opportunity for platforms to empower um, uh, civil rights groups is great, but it's also leading to a post-truth world where everybody starts with their own facts, uh, even though things such as uh, climate change aren't really subject to uh, quite honest dispute. Finally, text, uh, check is in the balance. You know, and I know we're going to hear from Danny on the Biden folks, from uh, Rob uh, on, uh, on some of the international uh, divergencies and from Josephine on, on some of the text itself. But here's where it really could go either way. We're at a crossroads. Start with infrastructure. Smart infrastructure makes all the difference. It can make a country far more productive, but it also enables a surveillance state. So how do you get the balance right on things like crypto? Uh, on trade, trade makes for faster growth, but it's led to increased inequality. We're seeing data protectionism. We know there's manufacturing by American, you know, the, the kind of the populist by local, the thinking. Uh, on workforce, uh, you know, immigration has made all the difference. That's why America's tech sector is the best in the world. Uh, we also need to do a better job at retraining. At the same time, automation is going to accelerate and outsourcing has been a challenge for a lot of the manufacturing workforce. Finally, last point I'll make, then I'll stop, Jim. Uh, the last issue that I see hanging there in the balance is uh, crypto, where on the one hand, all of us having quality encryption makes all of us safer. Uh, and, and I know the congressman was just in the last conversation um, uh, with Shane talking about, you know, the need for all of us to up our cyber hygiene game, which is true. At the same time, law enforcement has a tough enough job to do. And if they have a warrant, but they can't get at things, you know, that's what you see on Gab or Parler. That creates real systemic risk and trying to figure out how we're going to manage that uh, domestically and globally is, is a hot issue. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Um, definitely a, a, a lot on the plate, uh, both positives and negatives. Uh, but uh, I do like the emphasis on the positives for sure. Uh, so, Danny, um, you know, the Biden, Biden administration is working as quickly as they possibly can to fill key positions. It seems like every day there's a new one announced, um, especially for the, you know, the portfolio of folks who are going to have responsibility, uh, not only for the issues that Bruce mentioned, but uh, probably some of the technologies and issues that Josephine will bring up. Um, why don't you give us your thoughts on sort of what's been announced so far and any insights you may have on what we might to expect with uh, some future announcements? Uh, sure. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for having me. I want to thank Tim for inviting me as well. It's good to see friends. Um, you know, Bruce has one of the most organized minds in Washington, D.C. And the way that he presented and bucketed those issues 
I actually have absolutely no disagreement with. It's a very well uh, formulated way to look at the challenge. And so for the Biden administration, these tasks are cross-functional. They will touch on multiple agencies. They will touch on various constituencies and areas of expertise. And what we've seen so far gives me, and obviously I'm biased, uh, <laughs> an immense amount of, uh, of hope um, and faith. So we've seen Jake Sullivan named at the NSC, and he's named a team of cybersecurity folks to help him with the international issues there. Josephine knows some of those people well and can speak to that. Uh, my old friend Brian Deese, who uh, is at the NEC now and has brought on uh, a team of folks to think about how to build back better and ensure that um, we are injecting innovation, R&D, and the tech community into solving some of the economic restoration problems and some of the global economic challenges that we have. Um, at the State Department, Secretary Blinken is now in position. And the Secretary, I worked with the Secretary when I was at State, Secretary Blinken uh, has the full attention of the president, uh, his full faith and confidence, the degree to which these issues are international. And I know uh, he brought in Derek Cholet, for example, who uh, was uh, one of the, I think he was the number two at the German Marshall uh, Fund and has done a lot of work on the transatlantic digital relationship and transatlantic tech issues along with Karen Kornblue over there. So there is really a very, very strong team. And I would, there are a number of people I would add to that. Um, the uh, Governor Raimondo, who has just uh, went through her nomination hearing in commerce and hopefully will be com confirmed soon, will be taking the lead at commerce on issues around Section 230 and privacy and other issues. Quentin Palfrey, who served in the Obama administration and worked on the Obama initiatives then, is working over there now as the acting general counsel. So there, th this is, I think it was Ron Klain who said, we're not building a team of rivals, we're building a team of teams. The kind of people that have been brought in are people who have experience working with each other, have faith and confidence in each other, are familiar with the interagency process, are familiar with the consensus driven process. And I think that you're gonna see um, a lot of deference to expertise across the agencies and a reliance on expertise across the agencies, as well as an effort to ensure that all voices are heard on any given challenge. So um, at state, in addition to all of the people I met, I mentioned uh, Linda Greenfield Thompson, who's been named the ambassador to the United Nations, is a legend within the State Department. Uh, she will be able to have her pick of anyone she wants at the State Department to come to the UN. She is well known within the UN system. Uh, our re the President Biden's re-engagement with a multilateral community and a recommitment to cooperative and collaborative engagement abroad with a focus on democracy and a focus on human rights uh, will be critical to restoring leadership in the world. So that's where we are. And, and uh, I'm very pleased with the team that's been built and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thanks, Danny. And I'm going to come back to something a little later on what you talked about, but just to, you know, the re-engagement, you know, one of the first moves by the administration is to re-engage with the WHO. And um, I think that's, uh, you know, something a lot of folks are going to want to talk about uh, going forward. So, Rob, um, with every new administration, there, there does come a change of players. But I think one of the things that does not change as quickly is sort of the geopolitical challenges that are waiting for them. Um, you're probably more familiar with them than anybody else having most recently having to deal with them. Um, and it seems like now more than ever, uh, technology is a big driver of some of these challenges. Um, so why don't you give us sort of your top take on, you know, the top three or four uh, geopolitical challenges that the Biden administration is going to have to deal with. And um, if anybody would listen to you, maybe give them some of your advice as well. Great, uh, great question, Jim. Um, yeah, I mean, at this moment in time, there's probably, certainly in the internet era, there's more on the plates of uh, the individuals going to the State Department and those that are going to do international engagement at the various agencies and at the National Security Council and National Economic Council probably any time before. We're just seeing an increasing number of issues as um, Bruce laid out. And of course, you know, technology is also the driver of the solutions. I mean, we could not have gotten through the pandemic in the manner that we have without global flows of data. And the real risk with the way that so many of these issues could be dealt with in the end is that they will act in ways that cause further fragmentation of data flows of the internet and of digital services. Uh, you know, we don't have a treaty that governs the internet. 
There's no global law behind that. Uh, we have technical understanding about how the internet works, you know, through uh, the work of technical experts. We have the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IEEE. They've designed the protocols for the internet. But everything else, almost everything else related to the internet and digital services relies on global cooperation. And that's where the State Department, diplomatic uh, folks at, at the department, as well as across the uh, federal government are absolutely essential to helping solve the uh, range of challenges. And you know, the tools they use are more formal multilateral tools, like institutions like uh, the World Trade Organization or the OECD. Uh, they also have more informal multilateral frameworks that they can set up. Uh, just uh, two years ago, we had the uh, Czech Republic host the Prague Conference on 5G security and financing. That was an informal gathering that established principles that have been adopted by a large number of countries now. Uh, there's also the G20, which is more of a formal mechanism, but it also sometimes deals with uh, digital issues. I think one of the overriding uh, challenges is going to be uh, the concern about how countries can further their own technological sovereignty. Uh, some, some refer to that as their strategic autonomy. Uh, all countries at the end of the day are, are sovereign by definition. And to maintain that sovereignty, they need to decide and chart their own future, their own course. The challenge in the digital sphere is how we can ensure that there is uh, that sovereignty and that self-determination occurring uh, in their digital policy, while at the same time ensuring that we have that cooperation and interoperability uh, between borders that facilitates data flows in the internet. Uh, and that is most often borne out in policies related to privacy, uh, where we see an increasing number of countries uh, adopting uh, privacy frameworks that can cause data to be localized. Uh, we've seen that occur in India in their proposal, with their proposal of a personal data protection law. Uh, we've seen uh, the uh, disruption, potential soon disruption, likely soon disruption of data flows with Europe because of the Schrem II decision there, uh, which was very much focused on how uh, the U.S.'s intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies could obtain access to European individuals' data, in other words, violating their privacy. So uh, the privacy issue is, is fundamental and one that needs to be dealt with in different uh, jurisdictions around the globe in ways that can continue to allow interoperability while allowing each country to adopt slightly different uh, standards. In the EU, we're also going to see a whole new suite of regulations coming forward uh, in the last couple of months. We've just recently seen something called the Digital Services Act, which governs content moderation. Uh, they've also proposed the Digital Markets Act, which focuses on competition policy. There's major concerns with how those are going to be uh, worked out in the coming probably years uh, to go here, but how do we maintain the internet in the way that it functions today, that we have the best quality of services, and we're really only focusing on the true problems to the internet and still allowing competition and innovation to occur. Um, one area that uh, the administration is likely to take up is uh, one proposal is that Europeans have proposed a US-EU Trade and Technology Council, a framework for dealing with a number of digital policy issues to iron out bilateral regulatory uh, frameworks, as well as to work on global trade policy uh, in digital goods and services. So that trade and tech council is something the Biden administration is likely to pick up and one I would urge them to, uh, to pick up as uh, ITI has proposed in the last week, week or roughly week ago. So uh, I'll just close by thanking uh, all of you for participating. Your voices are so important in this, this overall debate. And uh, thank Jim for being our moderator and stay the net for having me again. Great, thanks, Rob. So, Josephine, um, Bruce, Danny, and Rob talked a lot about sort of the the issues that are here and now, and sort of, you know, in the present, so to speak. But from your perspective, um, what are the issues and, and really the technologies coming down the road that you think the the administration, the new administration, should be looking at and, and preparing for, whether it be this year or two or three years down the road? 
Thanks, Jim. I think it's a great and really hard question to sort of focus on when it feels like there are already so many pressing issues of tech policy, as my colleagues have just brought up. I'm going to bring up three very quickly that I think we don't talk about enough in the policy space and are worth trying to plan ahead for, even if they don't feel like the most urgent piece of what this administration has to deal with right off the bat. One comes back to the encryption issues that Bruce brought up. We get closer and closer to various forms of quantum encryption. We've seen sort of several significant breakthroughs in the past year or two. We don't know exactly what the timeline for that is going to look like, but we know that it's going to really challenge all of our existing infrastructure on how we protect data that's going over the internet at many layers of that infrastructure and that we're going to need to be sort of prepared with some of the standards that groups like NIST and others have been thinking about, but also prepared in an international context to think about how are different countries responding to this? What are the different priorities? What are the different technical ideas that different governments are preparing for? I was very struck, I will say, at the end of the last panel by the congressman saying that he thought diplomacy and cybersecurity were often not a good mix because that's something you hear a lot in the technology realm, right? A lot of technologists feel that if you want to secure something, you shouldn't be talking to policymakers about it. You should just go code it. And I think that sort of when we look at things like the future of encryption in this space, there's a real need to understand that it's not just about who's going to come up with the first quantum encryption algorithms or the most effective ones, but also whether we're going to be able to sort of continue the collaboration and the interoperability that Rob was just bringing up in a space where everybody's encryption landscape may be changing that quickly. Another area that I think is sort of imminent, if not here already, and worth paying some more attention to is around adversarial artificial intelligence and the question of sort of what we do as machine learning algorithms become easier to manipulate or our adversaries become better at manipulating them, whether that's through tricking the inputs or actually manipulating the algorithms themselves. And what our sort of preparations are, whether that's for autonomous vehicles that are relying on computer vision machine learning algorithms, whether that's for some of the biometric recognition algorithms that we're using now and will probably continue to use more in the future, and trying to understand whether there are any sorts of international norms, cooperation agreements that we can come to around the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence in that adversarial manner and what that might look like. And I think that will also tie into sort of thinking about the future of supply chain attacks and thinking about things like solar winds and cyber espionage in a forward looking perspective. How are we going to try to use diplomacy as another tool beyond just the technical tools we have to set some ground rules? about what we do and don't think is appropriate use of some of these technologies and where we should be going. And the final one I'll flag are Internet of Things devices and the questions of sort of whether there are going to be any security rules, whether there are going to be any assessments, whether there are going to be certifications. And we've seen a number of countries go in sort of some directions towards trying to set some of that up. The UK has been fairly aggressive in trying to roll out some, some uh, infrastructure in that area. And I think that's another sort of not quite here in a really immediate way, but certainly in the next few years going to become increasingly pressing. Great. Okay. Thanks, Josephine. And I already, I see that we've already got a few questions in the Q and A pod, but I, I'm going to get you warmed up with what are hopefully some softballs before we go to the real, uh, the real meaty ones in the pod. Um, so sort of jump ball, whoever wants to jump at it. Um, you know, with any new administration, there's always talk about the first hundred days. Uh, what are you going to get done coming out of the gate? So, you know, what do you think on the international front, particularly dealing with technology related issues, what do you think the the Biden administration needs to get done in this next hundred days. Uh, I'm happy to start. I, th I think one of the, the, the first things that's on the front, front burner for them is uh, post the SREMS 2 decision, uh, how do they replace the privacy shield agreement uh, with the European Union? Sure, that we can continue to have data flows uh, that benefit European companies as well as U.S. companies. So I think that's one of the first things that they'll be working on that came up in Governor Mondi's uh, confirmation hearing yesterday. I'm happy to add, you know, I think for the Biden administration, it's COVID, COVID, COVID for their first hundred days. You know, it's everything else that they want to do follows from their ability to be successful. You know, and the whole the whole pandemic feels like it's on the knife's edge where will vaccines or variants define, uh, you know, what happens in 2021. So I think rejoining the World Health Organization on day one was appropriate. 
Uh, I thought it was Secretary or incoming Secretary Blinken who said they're joining COVAX, which is a vaccine sharing approach, which is smart. I noticed the, uh, the administration is buying uh, 100 million more Moderna shots, which is good. But uh, when they figure out how to make sure Americans are getting vaccinated, I think it'd be pretty prudent for them to as fast as they can figure out how to take the excess supply we bought and how to really try to start building our soft power back up by helping uh, first responders and people around the world. The International uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce suggested it's a $9 trillion hit if only the developed nations get vaccinated and then the rest get left behind. Uh, last one I might uh, mention is I think they, as with any new administration coming in, you're in a honeymoon. Uh, play for time. So I think things like what Rob described about a council to talk about things, don't jam digital services tax through, um, but rather uh, take a pause and see if there is an opportunity to dialogue with the United States. At the end of the day, the only way the state-driven Chinese approach can effectively be countered is if you end up with something like a D20 or a D10, I'm sorry, a digital 10, where you take the G7, throw in Australia and India and Japan you know, and we find ways to coordinate on a lot of these technology policy issues before all of the uh, scary things that Josephine described uh, happen. Josephine, I was scared about murder hornets, but happily you took my mind off that with quantum encryption. So thank you. <laughs> Danny? Um, I, you know, some combination of, uh, of what Bruce and, and Rob said, I think are right. Uh, so the president has said, and has been quite clear in the rollout. COVID is the first priority. COVID relief is the first priority. The second is building back better the economy before the crisis. The third is dealing with climate change. And the fourth is dealing with racial inequality. And we're going to be doing them all. They're going to be doing them all at the same time. Right. Um, yes, COVID is the first priority, but there will be we will be the, the administration will be running parallel tracks on these these other matters. And the technology community is going to play a key role in, in that in that process. And these particularly COVID, um, COVID climate and economic inequality and restoration are global issues. And I agree with, uh, with Bruce that we need to build a coalition of democracies, both developed and developing, to address these issues with the first and highest priority being restoring transatlantic cooperation and trust. I think the only thing I'd add is less international focus, but it will eventually have a, a really strong international component, is that coming into a government that's been so thoroughly owned in ways that we have never seen before, the need to sort of review and overhaul all of the computer networks, understand exactly how deep the solar winds compromise goes, make sure that you really feel confident in the various networks and digital infrastructure you're relying on is also probably something that needs to happen in those first hundred days. That's a great point. You know, gonna... if, Jim, just real quick on, on Danny's point. Yeah. The, the, the core cross cutter is we need universal broadband. It's gone from what might have been a luxury 20 years ago to a necessity. If you want to reduce inequality, you need universal broadband. If you want to make us more resilient, you need universal broadband. If you want to have a, uh, a less carbon intensive economy, you need universal broadband. Uh, I suspect you find bipartisan support. The deal perhaps is Republicans have investment in, uh, in rural access and Democrats have investment in uh, less rural affordability. There's a deal to be had and there is an imperative to get it done. Great, so, so uh, Bruce, I'm gonna pick up on something you said because it, it relates to a question that's in the Q and A pod. It's from Kevin Allison. He said, it's been a lot of talk about the potential for a US EU cooperation on tech policy issues or other structures such as a D10 group of democracies to present a more common front on these technology issues vis-a-vis -vis China. How realistic is this and what are likely to be the hardest issues to find common ground on and where's the low hanging fruit? Uh, so I think it's realistic. I'm gonna do something that anybody on this uh, video watching me has never seen me do. I'm going to hand off the ball. This is Strayer's, this is what Rob's one of the best on the planet at. He's been thinking a lot about it. And within the United States NGO context, there's no group uh, more on the lead than ITI. So, Rob, I'm, I'm calling you, calling you out, call, phoning a friend, putting you on the spot. But you're you're a better answer on this than I am. Thanks, uh, Bruce. I, I owe you a, a check for that that promotion, well, way beyond my capabilities. Um, 
and and also I think we should uh, ping Danny at the end of this too to see if he's getting thoughts. But um, you know, the important thing to remember is that so much of what happens in the tech space is still going to be done through international standards bodies. So we're going to have international standards created on continue to be created uh, in, in a number of areas, including as we move from five G to six G. But the areas where there can be a lot of good cooperation are on export controls. We should have a multilateral export control regime so that when the U.S. says we're not going to uh, export a certain technology, that it's not backfilled immediately by another country. That disables and hurts the American uh, manufacturer of that, that technology because they're being undercut by somebody else. That's one of the easiest ones, I think, for us to say that's what a detention should focus on. There's other... Uh, so game-changing, transformational technology, like not just having 5G as a communications uh, technology for, for, tele for the consumer, but for the Internet of Things, for advanced manufacturing, for autonomous vehicles. That kind of game-changing R&D should be done in collaboration with a number of countries. And that gets at the concern that the Europeans have about tech sovereignty and wanting to raise up their tech sector. They should do that in partnership with uh, US and other Western companies that are in Korea and Japan and Australia and other places. So I, I think those are the two areas that I would highlight as, as front burner uh, topics for the, the D10 or broader group of like-minded uh, democracies. Mm -hmm. Danny, did you have anything to add? Um, yeah, the, the only thing I would add to that is that our, our and I, I, think, I, I think Rob probably experienced the same thing I did when, when we were at State, that when we're on a global stage, we're, we sit on the same side of the table as our transatlantic colleagues uh, on issues of human rights and speech, democracy. Um, so the distance between us is narrower than it is between the rest of the world. When we're on a one-on-one -on -one basis, those distances obviously become accentuated. Uh, and... I do think that getting that relationship right and trying to establish interoperable mechanisms for ensuring uh, that it, that the internet, not just the World Wide Web, but the internet as a whole uh, and communications continue to enable commerce and discourse across the Atlantic uh, and that we're facing the challenges together in an outward way uh, against what are different ways of viewing the use of technology, uh, both in markets and in, and in democracy. Josephine, do you want to add anything? Well, I guess I would say, um, and I have you know far less experience in government than everybody else on this panel, so you should trust them over me. If I were going to guess what was going to be the hardest stuff to agree on versus what was going to be the low-hanging fruit, I would say broadly the, the software is going to be the hardest piece to agree on vis-a-vis -vis China, and the hardware is going to be the easiest piece. Right, I think you can get at this point a number of those countries together with some fairly clear consensus around what they are and aren't comfortable with in terms of building Chinese or Huawei hardware into their networks. I think when it comes to things like TikTok, where you're looking at a software application and you're thinking about a different layer of the network, the question of what are the risks, how able are individual countries to sort of protect themselves against those risks is more all over the map. And I think that's going to be potentially a little bit of a, a trickier place to find consensus. I also think it's going to depend a lot on what the Biden administration's policy towards technology coming from China is, right? We don't have a very clear sense yet of how they're going to feel about the proposed TikTok ban or other things. And so it's a little hard to know how aligned they'll be with some of the other countries they might want to try this with. Great. Uh, lots of good questions coming in. So we'll just go to the next one that's in there. So uh, from Melinda Clem, um, do you anticipate the Biden administration following the examples of other nations, particularly Australia and the UK, with regards to expanding cyber instance response requirements uh, and disclosure of foreign investments in companies operating critical infrastructure. Jump ball, whoever wants to take it, go for it. Well, I'll start, although uh, Josephine, I was watching for your mute to go off because uh, you're our, uh, you're expert in a lot of the, uh, a lot of the cyber stuff here, but uh, I, I do think uh, post solar winds in particular, there's going to be a lot of uh, more scrutiny on, on supply chain. And uh, part of supply chain will include software and to try to just get a better understanding of um, what's, what's being supplied, who's it being supplied by, what is the stream by which it can be reviewed or audited. You know, I do think, I, I suspect there'll be a uh, nuance within the new administration. And so, you know, Huawei gear in your network is a meaningfully greater cyber threat than an app 
that you know lives and dies on your phone by the grace of the uh, of the gatekeepers iOS and, and Android anyway. Um, I suspect they'll take a look at the, that they'll that they'll distinguish that, but that they'll um, want to have more transparency and more awareness, less monoculture in uh, the vendors and the technologies that the government's using. Last thought, by the way, uh, Congressman Katko was right. At the same time, what's what solar winds? What always interested me is um, is the NSA not doing this? I mean, that was an espionage thing. They didn't knock, so far at least, they haven't leveraged it that we're aware of to knock anything down. I've always assumed that our cyber spies are in lots of networks that they weren't invited into. Uh, it feels to me, therefore, that it's going to be up to Rob and, and to some of the NGO types to ultimately help us push for what is uh, what Brad Smith would have called a, a, digit, a, a uh, cyber Geneva Convention. You know, nations are going to have to, no company is going to be able to withstand the best hackers from a nation state. It's just going to have to be like with chemical weapons, an agreement of what the red lines and what the boundaries are. And then we all, starting with us, are going to have to abide by them. I, I agree with that, Bruce, if that is a little bit of a tangent here, but I, I think that we do need to have a global discussion about the norms that we've we've been having for some time. But when it comes to Activities that are, are largely espionage related, are there certain lines that we want to uh, draw in that area that would say you can't, you can't, you should not take troves, you know, mi millions of personal data records, as we saw with the OPM hack or, or you know, potentially in solar winds where it's just indiscriminate. Is that a line that's too far? But that, the, the boundaries around that need to be uh, decided through diplomatic channels. It's not something that's, I think, obvious on its face. So I, I think that would be a great thing to have some lines. I think the U.S. government has not sort of been great at suggesting ones that it's willing to abide by. So I'm not wildly optimistic. I think the one kind of effort that, that I've seen in recent history was around economic cyber espionage and trying to pressure for a norm to conduct political espionage, but not economic espionage. And I think that that was, first of all, not wildly successful. And second of all, most of what we're talking about now, solar winds, Equifax, um, falls more into the political espionage bucket anyway. And so we would have to sort of revisit whether the U.S. was willing to cede any forms of that kind of espionage and agree not to conduct them itself. I do want to come back to the question that was initially asked about cyber incident reporting requirements. I think, yes, absolutely. If this administration is able to get through a data protection law, then a very significant component of that, I would guess, will be about incident reporting requirements. Um, I don't know the extent to which they're going to look like Australia and the UK. I think the things that we've seen sort of pushed for in the US are going to be more around cost data, more around things that could perhaps aid the insurance industry, um, potentially a little bit around sort of thinking or rethinking the timelines for notification, trying to standardize that a little bit across the country. I think that's very likely. The other part of the question about foreign investment and whether there are going to be new requirements around that, I think there I'm much less certain whether that's a priority. And that will depend a lot on sort of how, how this administration sets up its view on foreign investment and in technology and whether they view that as a, a threat or not. Jim, I, I am a little bit struck um, by the the kind of growing consensus around um, the ideas of like a, an EU US uh, trade and technology working group, a Geneva convention for cyber, these sorts of uh, very, and, and not because I think they're bad ideas. I, I think they are definitely ideas worth considering and maybe even moving on, particularly the transatlantic ones. Um, but because when I was working at the State Department, there was a general consensus against having governments come together to work on sort of unified consensus views around internet governance issues, right? So we've come, we've, we've come a little bit further toward the idea that, um, that there needs to be some greater collaboration and cooperation around what, what governance looks like and what's, what's within the parameters of what's okay. Uh, in terms of the of a Geneva Convention on Cyber, while um, it sounds good, it, it has it has a it has the benefit of having the worst Geneva Convention in it. The challenge is is that China has to be there, um, and so do a whole bunch of folks who aren't going to agree with you on the proper 
use of cyber tools or lack thereof relative to speech and a number of other issues. And um, the likelihood of coming to a consensus treaty, traditional negotiation on these issues is, is very, very small. I'm not even sure there's Senate support for anything like that. Um, but we do need to, I, and I would start smaller with, with more like-minded countries. A, a D10 sounds interesting. A transatlantic uh, collaboration sounds interesting. And then build out from there. Great. So thanks. So um, another question, this one, I'm presuming it's from Wolfgang Kleinbachter, uh, just judging by the, the nature of the question. Uh, and he's the only Wolfgang I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I've got two questions, one to Danny oh, to Danny and uh, uh, Rob. Do you expect that the Biden administration, one, will continue with Pompeo's clean network initiative? And two, uh, we'll come back to the G20 OECD BEPS negotiations on digital taxation and join the agreement until mid-2021 to avoid a European digital tax. So on the first question, I don't I don't know the answer to it. Um, there's the team is going to have to talk internally with experts in the security field about how to proceed. I would assume that if they did proceed, they would at least rename it or something else. On the second question, um, you know, I, I believe, and please correct me, Rob, if I'm wrong, that the Trump administration withdrew from those EEC, OECD conversations as part of our re-engagement of the administration's re-engagement of multilateral institutions, I suspect that they will re-engage them in addition to being a good way to open the door with Europe to ha help have them rethink their digital service taxes as constructed and try to deal with this question, not as one in which you are specifically targeting a specific industry or specific companies relative to questions of profit gained from companies within a jurisdiction that doesn't have a physical presence there, because that can be true among multiple uh, types of industries and companies. But to start to think about holistic rules that are non-discriminatory uh, to ensure that you're not getting, um, you know, companies, whatever jurisdiction they're in, trying to get out of what would be legitimate taxation. Yeah, if I can just follow on that. Yeah, Danny, you're exactly right uh, on on the OECD. Um, you know, we're very hopeful that the uh, Biden administration will will fully participate in the OECD process to lead to an outcome by by late spring and uh, you know solve the, the the taxation issues that have uh, allowed these uh, DSTs to proliferate. It's going to be very destructive to the global economy and to uh, all kinds of digital services if uh, those taxes uh, gain more traction and we don't have a global solution. Uh, on the on the um, on on the clean networks initiative, I agree with you that the administration is like is going to look at the policy and want it and, and unpack it further. I think there's a lot of things that people put into that stack of clean networks. Uh, when you're talking about secure five G networks. I would anticipate that they stick with that, but there's a number of other things related to uh, software and to who who has access to consumer data around the world. Should there be standards of trust? Should they have some kind of controls of by companies that are headquartered in democracies with rule of law, with independent judiciaries, where you know there's constraints on the intelligence services, unlike in China, where there's a national intelligence law and there's no limit on the Communist Party's ability to access data. I think that's going to be debated. And, uh, you know, th there's, there's a lot to unpack under that, that category. And I think there's far more discussion to be had. Great. So I'm going to, the next question up, um, I'm going to summarize part of it just because it's rather lengthy, but it seems as though it's from Rick Lane. Um, there's growing international concern as well as domestic concern about uh, ICANN's handling of the who is issue, in particular um, from law enforcement and from a uh, consumer protection standpoint. Um, is the Biden administration going to be able to work with Congress to ensure that um, who is is available to help protect consumers and America's cybersecurity? Well, I'm happy to start, though, uh, in the world of, of uh, transparency and unmasking. Uh, Rick and I are on opposite sides of lobbying this very issue. He's lobbying on behalf of a bunch of folks that want um, to uh, to uh, a, a so-called thicker who is, and I've represented ICANN for more than a decade. The challenge here is that under the GDPR, which is, you know, obviously European law, uh, the prior American approach to having more information on who is, which 
Rick represents the copyright community, and they're always interested in understanding who everybody is because they want to protect their IP, understandably. It's put ICANN in the vice of there's competing uh, norms and competing laws, and they're trying to have, you know, their job is to have um, a single phone book so that when you enter an IP address, it doesn't go to potentially two places and everybody can agree on one. It's the ultimate uh, bottom layer of infrastructure. And it's pretty critical that it's possible we leave them out of the fights over, you know, our way or the Europeans way. The, the negotiations are ongoing to try to find ways to make sure law enforcement, as well as the copyright folks, can get the information they need while the, uh, while the uh, GDPR privacy mandates are upheld. You know, it frankly might be an opportunity for the Biden administration to try to help find a way to accommodate the two. I've always thought that, um, and again, I'm paid to think this, but the shooting at ICANN is, is misplaced and unfair. You've got two national systems that don't agree with one another, and they're not a political body. Uh, we don't want them to be one either. So uh, I, I, I take issue with the premise of the question, uh, but uh, also acknowledge Rick and I are paid to fight each other on that question. Thanks, Bruce. Um, moving on, uh, we've got a question from Barlow Keener. Um, and this sort of feeds into one that I had lined up for you, sort of um, uh, thoughts on creating a digital platform agency as proposed by Tom Wheeler. I'm going to go ahead and take this one. Um, I, I've worked with Tom for many, many years. He's a friend and a mentor. I uh, have an immense amount of respect for him. And I think that some consideration at some point of an agency specialized on digital platforms, depending on size and scope and reach, is, is, is certainly possible. It's not a sort of first hundred days kind of question. Um, I think some of the conversations that you're gonna see in Europe are gonna consider this sort of question. I'm not at this point, personally, I'm not personally convinced it's necessary. I think we have um, you know, agencies for these purposes, uh, the FTC, possibly at the FCC, and you could uh, you know, bulk up those agencies and bulk up the existing infrastructure to deal with the challenges that are posed by, by new digital platforms uh, myself. But I, but I remain completely open to the idea, and I think that the way that Tom has presented it is, is both intellectually sound and, and should be heard. So, Danny, just picking up on something you said there, you know, there's multiple agencies. One of the, you know, the way the U.S. government as a whole is organized around tech issues, is particularly on the international front, which is the focus of this panel, um, where state has some responsibility, commerce has some, FCC. Is, you know, from your experience, is that really the most efficient way to handle this? Or, you know, should there be a reorg or consolidation of sorts to try and, you know, um, improve the interagency process and uh, make us even more effective on, you know, advocating our policies abroad? You know, at the risk of sound, making myself uh, sound or Rob sound inadequate, I do think that these issues have to be elevated within each of these agencies uh, in the interagency process. And I think that the National Economic Council, and National Security Council have to take a stronger role, a stronger centralized role in ensuring coordination across the agencies. But I do believe that uh, different agencies bring different expertise and different counterparts to the, to the table. Uh, and leveraging all of that expertise in all of those relationships is critical as long as you have a well-coordinated and objectives-based policy process by which to achieve whatever success it is that, that you're hoping to achieve. Okay. Uh, so from Mike Nelson, um, what can the new administration do to use IT and the internet to crack down on corruption around the world? Um, it's blocking, blocking progress on some key issues like climate, COVID, economic growth, and the other problems we face. Well, I'll just take part of that. Mike Nelson asked some of the best questions out there. So, you know, I, if I had that in advance, I still couldn't give a good answer to it. Um, <laughs> but uh, let me just take just one piece of it. And that is on the corruption point is blockchain could be a real way that we can, you know, one of the promises of that is that it's, you know, distributed ledger that's public and available. So it, it sort of works against corruption because corruption uh, can participate when it's when it's hidden. So when it's all exposed, you can see the transactions, whether that's customs duties being taken or some kind of other government payments or other regulatory transactions. When they're exposed to the public, you can help get at get at the the corruption. So blockchain is an area of IT that government should be using more and more uh, to provide services to the public. And I think 
Uh, Josephine also mentioned uh, IT modernization, I think, across the board. We all see great value in that. And a great and important nuance of what Rob just said is I'm sure some folks heard him and thought, you know, but don't terrorists or, or, uh, or others finance transactions with Bitcoin. Blockchain is a technology. Bitcoin is a single application of it. Uh, and obviously, making sure you can follow the money is pretty important in international criminal activities. But that doesn't, therefore, apply to all of blockchain. Blockchain is an unbelievably uh, powerful and, and, and uh, promising technology for the reason Rob described. So just for those who are looking at the, uh, at the time, uh, we've been told that we do have some time to fill afterwards. Um, I guess there's some scheduling issues that are following us, so we're going to keep going. So I'd encourage folks to continue to put questions into the, the, ch the pod. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to throw one at you, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to own this phrase, but I'm going to use it because it's been kicked around in the media a lot. And that is, um, you know, some have said that the Biden administration is looking a little bit like a third Obama administration. Um, and if you accept that premise, um, what lessons can Obama three learn from Obama one and two when it comes from dealing with issues, uh, the technology issues on the international front? I'm going to go ahead and take this one. Um, if I know both men. I know President Obama and, and now President Biden fairly well. And, and most people who've worked and lived in Washington uh, may not know them personally, but know that they're vastly different politicians. Their approach to public policy, their approach to governance is somewhat different. Um, and I think that the way that you've seen President Biden organize his uh, administration and, and organize the transition does rely on a significant portion of the expertise that comes from the Obama-Biden family and builds on it. Uh, and I think that's good. But the world is different today than it was when uh, the officials that you're seeing come into the administration now left it four years ago. And we've those people have learned a lot in that time. You see that in the transition. Um, and you see an elevation of folks from what they served in previously to where they serve now. And it creates different opportunities. Uh, you know, we're facing different challenges or similar challenges that have been accentuated. And I think, um, I think if you look at how well the transition was managed, how efficiently and how capably it was managed, I think it sends a, a really strong message about how well the administration is going to administer its tasks and, and, uh, and I don't think that that reflects the third Obama administration, but really a, an, an evolution of where we as a party were then and we and those Biden officials were then as people and professionals and where we are now. Uh, and I think that the vice president, by making issues like the centrality of climate change, the centrality of racial equality, uh, those are are really an elevation of issues that were um, that were not as high on the priority list under the Obama administration than they are today. I might uh, I might add on. I don't know both men uh, the way Danny does, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn last night. Uh, it's Danny. The other big difference I think is that entering you know the, where we were in the world first tech was seen as generally an all-encompassing thing at the start of Obama, and it was the launch of the social media revolution then. And I think now at the start of President Biden's tenure, um, there is a recognition that technology is not exactly the same as platform social media all the time. In fact, you know, when you took a look at, the, uh, at, at Edelman's trust uh, information barometer that just came out, the most trusted sector was technology and the least trusted sector they had was social media. You know, there are obviously ways in which all of those grand challenges can be addressed by constructive use of social media. But we've also seen um, that, uh, that there, are, uh, there are reasons to be more concerned. So I think whereas when Obama started, tech was good. The internet was good. Uh, uh, now, at the start of the uh, Biden era, it depends, and I think that's probably a more honest uh, acknowledgement of, of of technology in the world in 2020, as contrasted to where things were in 2009. You know, at, at the risk of turning this into the Bruce and Danny show, I I agree with that and kind of live the evolution of that. So, when we as as uh, as Democrats started looking at these issues you know, with the growth of the internet in 98 and then all the applications that came on top of it, the, the goal here was to democratize civic participation and democratize commerce. 
ensure that innovators and, and newcomers to markets and ideas could challenge existing incumbents and do so on a relatively frictionless playing field. Uh, and what we've learned over time that is that is that is true, but it's true just as true for bad ideas as it is for good ideas. And it's in there are vulnerabilities to manipulation of both platforms and technologies that we have to guard against and have a responsibility to do so as public leaders. And that evolution is now felt through to where you're going to see Amy Klobuchar talk, Senator Klobuchar talk later today about her evolved thoughts on where the government should be relative to competition, for example. Right, if I may, just, you go okay, go ahead, Rob. Um, I, I would just say that uh, this is not so much about the, 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 the men that are the presidents, but about the, the time that we're in, and it's, it's about China. Uh, far, there's, a, there's a bipartisan consensus that we need to deal with China in ways differently than we did uh, just over four years ago, that uh, you know, further in economic integration in itself is not going to lead to the, the breaking down of market access barriers uh, to what we've just seen in the last several months coming out of China, which are a data security law and a personal information protection law under somewhat obtuse standards. They're gonna make it very hard to move data uh, in and out of China, uh, as well as on the human rights front, uh, particularly regarding the Uyghurs. Um, those are issues that the Biden administration, or sorry, the Biden administration is going to wrestle with now that are that are in a different place than they were, you know, just over four years ago. So I, I, I think that will also shape some major policy areas in the digital environment that we're all, you know, well aware of, and it's it's going to be a big challenge. And you know, they're also going to inherit what was left from the Trump administration, which is more than three hundred billion dollars of of goods that have tariffs on them, as well as the Phase One deal. They need to decide what they want to do with that how they're going to use uh, that type of leverage uh, to achieve the end for the American people. I was going to take the okay. question perhaps a little bit more literally and, and think about the things you might take from the, the first two, or not the first two, the two Obama terms and try to learn from moving forward. And two that come to mind, one is sort of the inefficacy of the naming and shaming strategy that began under the Obama administration and continued during the Trump administration in which our response to several, though not all, major cybersecurity attacks was to file an indictment and sort of make a big fuss, mock up wanted posters for foreign officers of the Chinese military, the Russian military, and sort of on the hope that this would dissuade them from initiating similar types of attacks or espionage efforts in the future. And I think that, you know, while I think that's an interesting effort and I don't necessarily think it should end, I think it's been pretty clear that that hasn't actually served as the kind of deterrent that we might have hoped it would. And the other sort of related thing I would say is one of the hallmarks for people who study cybersecurity and cyber conflict under the Obama administration was a real sort of forbearance, a real desire on the part of the United States not to use any kind of cyber power with the, the sort of one exception. And that there's also, I think, a stronger sense today that that's not actually a way to deter other countries from using their own capabilities and their own um, offensive sort of cyber tools that we perhaps might have hoped it would. And I think those are both perhaps useful lessons. Great. So uh, some more questions from the pod. Um, we've got one from an anonymous attendee. Um, what in your view needs to occur to get uh, countries such as the U.S. to participate in global standards and norms of information sharing and governance? Uh, I, I can start on that and let others supplement. Um, you know, right, right now, there's a very active participation in technical standards bodies. Uh, the ones that created 5G, which is called the Third Generation Partnership Project, or 3GPP, uh, you know, you had active participation from you know, a range of companies, including Qualcomm and, and others that are very involved in, in creating the standards for, for 5G. And companies participate in standards all the time. The a separate issue is the norms, the norms about responsible use of artificial intelligence, um, norms about uh, cyber tools, uh, you know, when, when it's not appropriate to um, undermine critical infrastructure with cyber, by cyber means or to steal intellectual property. 
Those are ones that the U.S. has been working with other governments on for roughly the last decade, uh, th those kind of government-to-government -government norms. Um, it, it, it's painstaking, slow work to get, get those uh, off the ground and get agreement. And as, as uh, Danny mentioned, it's important at the end, really, that we get agreement from Russia and China's of the world that they are also going to live by those norms. But it helps to have all your friends with you first when you go to uh, take on the, those others that might be acting in contravention of those norms that most of us think are common sense. Um, so the OECD is one of the key places. I think we've seen really good norms development. There were ones made on AI in May of 20. 19 that were later endorsed by the G20 about trustworthy use of AI that should be human centric and it should be uh, consistent with our democratic values and with principles of fairness in mind. So I, I think there's, there's more to be done on the norms, norms front rather than the, the technical standards, but we need to make sure the technical standards remain vibrant bodies where uh, all global companies are really participating and we're getting the best uh, ideas coming to the surface and dominating the standards. Anyone else? I think another piece of this, which is really important, is recognition by the United States government that they do not have the far and away best cyber capabilities in the world, and that they're sort of have really, really serious adversaries with really sophisticated technology. And I think that you know, has already and may in the future even more so drive some recognition that they need to be willing to cooperate with some of these international processes and think about the ways in which some of those agreements might benefit them. Jim, if, if I could raise something that we haven't talked about yet, um, but I think is super important in light of sort of what Josephine just said and what we've been talking about, is that at the root of all of this, all of this great and incredible technology, as well as the challenges we're facing from abroad, from adversaries, is, is the talent and capabilities that you have to build these, these tools and technologies. Uh, so the degree to which we are not bringing the best and the brightest from the world into the United States, welcoming them here to participate both as creators, as wealth creators and innovators, the harder it's gonna be for us to lead on issues like security, the harder it's gonna be for us to lead on issues like AI. And I think um, I think that's one thing that there, there is a political agreement in, within the tech community on, uh, as well as in the in the academic community uh, on the need for us to ensure that that we're doing what we can to to attract the best and the brightest and to and to invest in in talent at home. Great point. I agree. All right. I know. I think I believe we have about six more minutes till the next panel gets going. So, um, uh, we'll I, one sort of wrap up question, and it's a. A little, little cheesy, I'll admit, but uh, gives you a chance to stuff a lot of it, uh, of what you want to say into it. And that is um, around the inauguration, there's always attention paid to the letter that the departing president leaves to his successor. Um, and, you know, if you could leave a letter to the person who is uh, filling your role or what is close to what your role was in the current administration, um, what would it say and what would you tell them success looks like, you know, three years from now? Uh, Josephine, I'll, I'll let you go last, but you can address your letter to whoever you want. Who wants to go first? I'm happy to start um, and, 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 and know, know that my, my letter uh, should be subject to revision later. Uh, it's, it's almost when you're speaking to the natural language uh, uh, software and it's going to be all kind of garbled. But I, I think uh, having most recently come from government of the folks on the panel, um, it, it, it's maybe easier for me to say that I, I think that continuing to build these partnerships of the like-minded about norms uh, on responsible use of cyber tools, um, you know, and then developing additional consequences that go with those, as Josephine noted, you know, the, we, the Trump administration were using indictments and um, the public declaration of, of who committed these um, cyber acts that were beyond the pale. Um, but there needs to be a coalition of countries that bring similar uh, consequences against those aggressor cyber nations. 
uh, to uh, change their opinion about whether or not it's worth taking on those those malicious cyber activities. So I think continuing to build the coalition of the like-minded and and uh, routinize it, which is something we were doing in the Trump administration, and, and that that process started you know back in the Obama administration. But I think it's something that should continue forward. And then the, the second part of this would be uh, working together, as I said before, in the in the question about the D D10 that. There's so much that can be gained that we can grow the scale that we need among like-minded countries and uh, companies that have the best values in mind about responsible use of artificial intelligence, uh, about um, about the next generations of, of 5G when it when it's feeding it, it that kind of technology is feeding into all kinds of applications. Um, that that is something that we want to see uh, democratic countries get behind and, and guide uh, forward. So building. Uh, like-minded coalitions in that area as well. I'll make mine a little quicker because uh, my job no longer exists. <laughs> ben Wu had it after me. He was the last guy to have it. But but two things I feel like I took away that I'd want to apply in a future role. First, how important it is to listen to all sides. The political environment is so hyper-partisan that the instinct is just listen to the people from your own team or the people who supported your boss. That's such a mistake. You know, it's it's you need to understand what uh, R's and D's, progressives, the establishment, moderates, all hear all sides out. If you want to give the best advice to your boss and come to the best answers. Uh, number two, in some ways, the importance of being contrarian. And so, you know, knowing everything we know now, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, our mistake was kind of believing the uh, the techno optimist. Nothing bad will happen. The Internet solves every problem. Um, it's all going to be good. And I do think folks who are stepping into the role today now have the run the opposite risk of, you know, everything sucks. The Internet's terrible. It's why I opened with all the ways in which technology is actually the key to so many critical solutions to make the world a better place. And I think 20 years from now, when we read about this time in history, what people are going to recognize is we are so busy worrying about murder hornets that we missed a Cambrian explosion of innovation and investment that was catalyzed by uh, response to the challenges of 2020. Um, so to whomever would take my, mine and Rob's job, or hopefully if it's elevated, it's someone more senior than us that would take that job. You know, I would say to, to lead as, as Secretary Blinken has said with, with humility and confidence and to recognize that it is an immense honor to serve your country. And it gives you the capability to surface ideas from so many different sources. You don't have to know everything, that there's greater capabilities in cooperation and collaboration, that uh, there's almost always a zone of agreement, whether it's across the aisle with our friends uh, on the Republican side, or it's across the Atlantic with our like-minded friends uh, in, in those jurisdictions or in Brazil and, and India and elsewhere, that that there is an immense of opportunity to um, to do good and that that this is this is a critical time to try to find that kind of incremental progress that can do as much good as possible uh and, and it's it's a just a critical time to engage the process and i have never run the nsa and certainly never will run the nsa but i think i'd be inclined to leave a letter for general makasone and ask is there anything you can live without? Are there any things the United States would be willing to not do in the cyber domain, would be willing to sacrifice uh, for the purposes of trying to forge an international agreement that would allow other countries to feel that they were getting something out of it as well and not just being bent to the United States as well, that might actually benefit the US as well. That might actually serve, serve a better purpose than just keeping all of our capabilities and tools in the chest. Well, great. All, all wonderful answers. And, um, you know, I always like ending these panels on a positive note. So uh, um, thank you very much for your time. A very interesting discussion, covered a lot of topics, um, forward-looking as we wanted to. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we couldn't be there in person to carry on these conversations in the hallway after we're rushed off stage because we're running long. But um, hope everybody continues to stay safe. And uh, I'm being told I should turn it over to Tim now. So thanks for everyone.